Get the little ones, sit back, relax, and listen to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Part 5 of The Children's Book of Christmas by J.C. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5. From Far Away. From far away we come to you, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, to tell of great tidings, strange and true. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. From far away we come to you, to tell of great tidings, strange and true. For as we wandered far and wide, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, what hap do you deem there should us be tied? Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. Under a bent when the night was deep, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, there lay three shepherds tending their sheep. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. O oh, ye shepherds, what have ye seen? The snow in the street and the wind on the door, to stay your sorrow and heal your teen. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. In an ox stall this night we saw, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, a babe and a maid without a flaw. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. There was an old man there beside, the snow in the street and the wind on the door. His hair was white and his hood was wide. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. And as we gazed this thing upon, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, those twain knelt down to the little one, minstrels and maids, stand forth on the floor. And a marvelous song we straight did hear, the snow in the street and the wind on the door, that slew our sorrow and healed our care, minstrels and maids, stand forth on the floor. News of a fair and a marvelous thing, the snow in the street and the wind on the door. Noel, 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 we sing. Minstrels and maids stand forth on the floor. From far away we come to you to tell of great tidings, strange and true. Lordings, listen to our lay. Lordings, listen to our lay. We have come from far away to seek Christmas. In this mansion, we are told, he his yearly feast doth hold, tis to-day. May joy come from God above to all those who Christmas love. Where the Christmas Toys Come From Almost all the wooden toys come from Germany, where peasants in the mountains of the Tyrol and Bavaria still make them by hand. A herd boy on the hillside will see that his cattle are safely feeding in a narrow valley, which they cannot leave without passing him and then he will sit on the grass or on a rock and whittle and whistle or yodel as the soft wood shapes itself in his fingers through a long summer day and during the winter while the snow lies deep on the mountain paths entire families give their time to making noah's arks toy villages with stiff little green trees toy furniture carved figures of all kinds anything which a man's knife can make from poplar or plain wood is carved during the long weeks when outdoor work is impossible at one time whole german villages used to work in their own homes on cheap wooden toys of all kinds nowadays since the invention of the machines by which the simpler forms are made most of the toy trays have been swept into the factories of German cities. Toy reins, such as you see with tinkling sleigh bells on them, may be woven elsewhere in New England, but it is fairly certain that the bells at least are made in Connecticut, where the industry is a very old one, and where most of the sleigh bells in the country have been made, as well as cowbells and the tiny tinkler on the tea table and naturally the state in which are so many clock factories produces those toys which are made to go by a winding key hundreds of thousands of tin trumpets and other toy musical instruments which used to be made in france and germany are now made in this country mainly in pennsylvania and new york 
It is fascinating to watch the making of them by machinery. Pull a handle here, click, down comes a frame, and a long sheet of metal is cut into pieces of the exact shape wanted. See, the frame on which the metal rested is a moving belt bringing a fresh sheet of metal under the stamps, and at the same time carrying the cut pieces forward over a row of steel cones where a set of clamps, like steel jaws, catches each separate bit. The clamps close once, nip, open, and each cone pushes forward with a jerk into another, which, with one motion, adds a mouthpiece. What passes on now is a bent tube, which needs only a touch of solder to keep it closed, a few rings of paint to make it gay, and perhaps a curved handle to be a very presentable toy trumpet. Drums are almost all made in Massachusetts. Marbles, the best of them, come from Saxony. The old-fashioned kinds of music boxes, some of them very elaborate and beautiful, still come from Switzerland. Glass ornaments for Christmas trees are made in Germany. Many of the tinsel and cut paper ornaments also come from Nuremberg and other German cities, which are the great toy markets of the world. In one French village near Paris, almost all the bone dominoes have been made for years. Another section of France turns out nearly all the bone chessmen, such figures as Alice found in the looking-glass country, and a quantity of the furry rabbits, silky-haired dogs, and woolly lambs on green-painted bellows, which bleed bah, have been made by one Parisian family for many years. The old proprietor, his sons and daughters, and even grandchildren, have lived and worked together at the very top of an old house in one of the side streets of the city, from a time beyond the memory of all but a few. As for dolls, the making of a Christmas doll, that is another story. The Making of a Christmas Doll Does it seem to you that it would be a delightful business to make hundreds of thousands of dolls every year? Hmm? Does this huge kettle of bad-smelling mush make you think of the dainty, smiling dolls in the toy shop window. Dolly is made, though you would never guess it, of chopped up bits of old kid gloves and pieces of cardboard boiled to a pulp in a gum made from the horns of goats. And here is a man shoveling sawdust into a kettle half full of boiling water. Now he is turning the mass into a big mixing trough, adding one shovelful after another of the gluey mush. The machinery creaks and turns and cuts and slaps as this mixture is kneaded into a composition pulp. Now he is carrying some of it in a hod, for all the world, like sticky mortar, to a weighing table. Sweep, it is spread out in an even thickness. Clip, down come the knives, which parted into the right quantities, and it is swiftly pressed and molded to the shape of a body, an arm, or a leg. In one factory alone, the parts of as many as 40,000 dolls are thus made in one day, and the ugly greenish shapes set aside to harden. Another day they pass quickly under the brushes in the painter's hands, after which they have the more familiar rosy pink color, and a dolly can now be put together except for the head. Of these dolls, the heads are to be made of porcelain. Once for all long ago, some artist made the model of which many duplicate molds stand ready. Into these molds, liquid porcelain clay is poured. Before it hardens, the openings for the eyes are cut, and tiny holes made by which it can be joined to a body. After the molds are opened, as the rows and rows of little heads stand in metal trays, a painter comes by, covers them with a glaze wash, tints the cheeks, and outlines the brows and lashes. Now into the oven goes the tray for hours of slow baking, but even with the head sewed on, we have but a sad-looking dolly, both blind and bald. If all goes well, the eyes and the wig come next. The eyes are not made in this factory at all. They come from Germany, and it would probably give you a queer, scared feeling to see the making of them. 
look into this long dark room and when your eyes are a little used to the strange shadowiness you will see that down its sides there are rows of tables before each of which sits a woman with a blue flame gas lamp in front of her at little distances are retorts of glowing molten glass and each woman dips her short glass tube into the melted glass and keeping it soft by the help of that weird blue flame of the blowpipe jet blows a little oblong globe which she colors white for the eyeball and then upon it paints a pupil of blue brown or black as the doll makers may have ordered the musical click which you hear all the time is the sharp stroke which breaks the finished and cooled eye from the glass rod letting it drop into a box lined with cotton by her side this boy coming out has been collecting them and it makes us shiver to see those hundreds of eyes rolling uncannily at us from the bottom of his basket come away a wig for an inexpensive doll is an easy matter the chosen strands of hair are laid along a double thread which passes below one strand and above the next this thread makes the part and under it is stuck a bit of pasteboard by which the wig is fastened on a quick-fingered frenchwoman can turn out over a hundred dozen such wigs in a day and with the wig dolly is made at last her clothes of course are a separate matter just as yours are there are dolls shoemakers and dolls dressmakers and the elaborate completeness of dolly's outfit depends only upon the price one is willing to pay irina's day on the estates irina is a russian who answers promptly if you ask her what christmas she remembers best the one we spent on the estates but that may be because it was so unusual to be there at all in the winter christmas eve is the great time in russia but santa claus does not come until evening and the day before christmas being a fast day is usually somewhat depressing old mashinka who comes in to open the heavy outer shutters usually has some lively gossip to tell while she lets in the light perhaps wolves slipped into the courtyard in the night and were fighting with the watchdogs perhaps the snow has fallen again and is so deep that ivan and the stableman have been out since daybreak cutting new paths to the kitchens stables and farm buildings and breaking out the roads or perhaps dmitri who moved yesterday into a new house took with him a cock and hen and this morning the cock refused to crow at dawn so that all the family are sure that evil fortune will enter the house with the new year but on this morning she has no news to tell she moves silently and slowly for it is a fast day even irina who is always ready to run and jump feels oppressed by the still silent house the dining room is desolate with its breakfastless table usually so cozy with its steaming samovar as a rule they are at this time in st petersburg where though arena stays quietly all day in an upper room except when attending church services she can at least look out upon all the coming and going on the river and the nitsky prospect but this year andre the steward is raising questions about the plans and locations for new stables and barns so they are here where everything is depressingly still and silent and upstairs her father and mother are praying in their rooms so she puts on fur-lined boots a long fur coat with deep collar and a fur cap which comes well down over the forehead and once outside the house finds herself in the thick forest further on she comes to a frozen river and fast days and solemn services are all forgotten for there are her two fur-wrapped brothers busy with a little sled the red scars of the boys are taken for guiding reins and far along the ice for two hours or more she drives her team they have passed beyond the forest and out upon the steps where for miles ahead no trees are to be seen except where willows mark the curve of the river 
or a few stunted saplings show black against the snow. On one side is a long, low sheepfold belonging to Irina's father, and out comes the shepherd with a clamor of dogs. He has no chairs, so he throws down three heaps of clean straw for the children to sit on, and he, too, forgets that it is a fast day as he reaches cakes of dark brown bread from a shelf below the tiny square window and pours for them cups of goat's milk. Black crust and all, it goes quickly, and then they rest and stroke the half-tamed sheep that comes to nibble the straw while the shepherd tells the children stories. He cannot read, to be sure, but when he was a boy, his old grandmother told them to him. Perhaps because it is the Christmas season, he tells them of the old woman whom the Russians call Babushka and the Italians Bifana. Irina's favorite is one that would remind you of Cinderella, although the fairy godmother is much more like an old witch. And as the children start off for home, they wonder a little fearfully if this forest is not very like the one in the shepherd's story. On arriving home, they confess their sins. Only the little matter of the rye bread is really forgotten. Everybody is busy. The cook is getting the supper, and father in the drawing room has the door locked. Someone has said there will be no Christmas tree, for there are no shops here. But why was mother away for four days, and why did that peddler who came by a few days ago stay so long? Irina finds a book, curls up on a rug, and tries to read. But she does not understand Krylov's fables very well. The day outdoors has made her drowsy, and she does not quite know what becomes of the time until her brothers shake her a little, the clock rings out cuckoo six times, and then open comes the door. There is a Christmas tree after all, a tall one with a shining star at the top. Hundreds of burning candles light it up, and tiny wax figures dance among hanging oranges. At the foot of the tree lie four or five heaps of parcels. Ah, then mother was shopping. No one is forgotten, and everyone is merry. Then comes Pavel to say that supper is ready. But the white cloth looks very different from usual. It is not laid smoothly at all. Underneath it has been spread a layer of hay, and each one, as he sits down, pulls out a straw. Arena gives a cry of joy. Her piece is quite complete with its yellow dried flower, which shows that she will be lucky all the next year. There is no meat at this Christmas Eve supper, only fish dishes and the special kostya, or puddings, which belong to the season very much as do mince pie and plum pudding in England. Of these puddings there are two kinds— the white kostya made of rice, almonds, and raisins, and the black kostya made of honey, barley, and walnuts. During supper, the children from the village school, which Arena's mother has started, come and sing carols outside the window, while Pavel, with a handful of coins, tells them to be off. Other young villagers follow to acknowledge their gifts with more singing. Lastly comes the church choir, who are invited in to supper, after Irina and her brothers have returned to the tree and their new toys. For each there is a gift, and from each a torrent of good wishes. This practice of carol singing is probably in its origin, akin to the religious processions which one may see on any holy day in all the villages of Greece, the Balkan provinces, and up through Russia, wherever, in fact, the Greek church has diverted into the service of religion the old customs of the people. For centuries back, and probably long before the Christian era, it was the practice of all the young people here and elsewhere to gather into bands and go about the country roads at this time of year, singing hymns, which were at first, no doubt, songs of rejoicing that the shortest days were over and the sun returning to the world again. Nowadays the songs are chants or carols, and the village boys are proud to carry in religious processions pictures of the saints and the banners of the church. A Visit from St. Nicholas 
"'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mamma in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer? With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and he called them by name. Now, Dasher, now, Dancer, now, Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So, up to the housetop, the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas, too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each tiny hoof. As I drew in my head, and turning around, down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose he sprang in his sleigh to his team gave a whistle and away they all flew like the down of a thistle but i heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight happy christmas to all and to all a good night the cratchit's christmas dinner you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course and in truth it was something like it in that house mrs cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot master peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour miss belinda sweetened up the applesauce martha dusted the hot plates bob took tiny tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, 
surveying one small atom of a bone on the dish they hadn't ate it all at last yet every one had had enough and the youngest cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows but now the plates being changed by miss belinda mrs cratchit left the room alone too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in suppose it should not be done enough suppose it should break in turning out suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the back yard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose a supposition at which the two young cratchits became livid all sorts of horrors were supposed hello a great deal of steam the pudding was out of the copper a smell like a washing day that was the cloth a smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress next door to that that was the pudding in half a minute mrs cratchit entered flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy and bedight with christmas holly stuck into the top oh a wonderful pudding bob cratchit said and calmly too that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by mrs cratchit since their marriage mrs cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour everybody had something to say about it but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for so large a family it would have been flat heresy to do so any cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing at last the dinner was all done the cloth was cleared the hearth swept and the fire made up the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire then all the cratchit family drew round the hearth in what bob cratchit called a circle meaning half a one and at bob cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle these held the hot stuff from the jug however as well as golden goblets would have done and bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily then bob proposed a merry christmas to all my dears god bless us which all the family re-echoed god bless us every one said tiny tim the last of all End of part five. Thank you for listening to the Saturday Story Circle right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Please consider subscribing to other days of the Mutual Feeds, including Monday Matinee for classic live and theatrical audio plays, Tuesday Terrors for horror audio drama, Wednesday Wonders, our science fiction and fantasy magazine, Thursday Thrillers for action, adventure, mystery, and crime drama, Friday Follies, our end-of-the-week comedy series, and Sunday Showcase, bringing you the very newest in audio releases from the week from our United Artists of Audio, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.